So let's continue on uh, to our special guest, Matt Merton. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Matt um, and then I'll ask a couple questions, then I'll open it up to Q&A. So use that raised hand, raise hand feature. Uh, if you have questions for Matt, you can raise them whenever you're ready and I'll get to you. Um, and uh, Matt, I'm gonna put you in the spotlight so everyone can see you. Hello. Hello everybody, thank you for having me. You're welcome, thank you for joining yeah. us. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I think if anyone on this call knows your story, but I'm going to give it anyways, just for the record, and in case anyone's not too familiar. So uh, Matt Merton was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but uh, became a prized baseball uh, prospect and recruit in Georgia. He went on to play ball at Georgia Tech. Uh, he burst onto the scene as a freshman and never really looked back, uh, becoming a first rounder of the Red Sox in 2003. Uh, he continued to rake in the minor leagues, uh, so much so that the Cubs wanted him. He was a part of a huge trade with Nomar Garcia Parra in 2004. And then the following year, he became the Cubs every day. Uh, the following year, made his big league debut. And then the year after that, became their everyday left fielder. Uh, that would be 2006. Um, the next few years were a bit unsteady. There is time in AAA. He was traded to the A's, traded to the Rockies. Um, and then he finally settled down, or I guess you could say settled down because he really just kind of took off uh, with the Hanshin Tigers in 2010. So uh, in 2010, he etched himself into NPB's history books uh, by breaking Ichiro Suzuki's single season hits record. And then um, went on to play five more seasons with the Hanshin Tigers. Uh, over those six years, he became one of NPB's greatest import players ever. Um, and despite the frequent media uh, flack you got, uh, he still was adored by uh, the Tigers faithful who are, you know, they're the passionate fans there and, and they all love Matt. Um, and I know we got a lot of Tigers fans on here that can attest to that. Um, in, addition, in addition to Matt's hits record, he had four all-star appearances, four best nine, awards, um, essentially batting title, um, and really just a tremendous career in Japan. Uh, most recently, Matt worked in baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs. Um, if LinkedIn can be trusted, uh, he's currently helping out with the baseball team at Grace Christian Academy in Tennessee, and also uh, raising his beautiful family of, with five kids uh, with his wife, Stephanie, which I'm sure is more than a full-time job. <laughs> Um, so anyway, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. It's really great to see you. I've been wanting you to come on this for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're here. And thanks to Paul Pass, who's on the call today for uh, putting us in touch. Yeah, for sure, man. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I am going to start with a couple uh, you know, foundational questions uh, about your earlier part of your career. And then um, we already have some hands raised, so I'll kick it to the audience uh, right away. So I'm just curious about um, when you first in 2010 or end of 20, not 2009, uh, how did the offer to go to Japan materialize and what was your decision-making process like in accepting it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, I think when you're met with that opportunity, I think it's, a lot of it is dictated or dependent upon um, kind of where you've been over the last few years. And I know for me specifically, um, having gotten to the big leagues at a relatively young age, my mind was like, and my heart was fully set on playing in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. So in 2009, when I received the phone call from my then GM, Dan O'Dowd of the Colorado Rockies, kind of suggesting that there was this opportunity at first, I wasn't necessarily really keen on it, to be honest with you. And, uh, it took me some time of, you know, my wife, Stephanie actually knew far before I did, she was pregnant with our second child. Uh, who Macy, who was born in Kobe that first year that we were there, um, she kind of knew far before I did that this is kind of what she felt like we were supposed to do. And so slowly but surely, I got there. And uh, it's a slow burn for me. But once I, once I finally get to that conclusion, then it's all in. So I didn't want to make that decision until I was all in. And we did. And it was, uh, it was an experience that we'll never forget. That's awesome. If I'm sure you've come across a number of players um, who were making that same decision themselves after you, what advice do you typically give to guys who are trying to make that decision of whether to go or not? Oh, for sure. You know, I, I think so much of it is, is dictated based on the individual, right. And what they, and what they uh, face when they get there, because we could, we could spend a long time talking about the variance from one club to another, even within Japan and how foreigners 
are received in one place versus potentially another. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I, I think that one of the biggest things, uh, pieces of advice you can give is that you need to first and foremost recognize the fact that um, while you should never forget uh, who it is uh, that you are and where it is that you come from, you, you need to be prepared um, to adhere to a, a new culture, a new style of sorts, and you need to come open-minded. Um, if you're willing to come open-minded and ready to compete and engage culture, I think you have a far greater chance of, of staying a, around for a little while. But if you go in kind of with uh, this idea of I'm going to go in and do it my way, I just, I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the, uh, the, the best end result when it comes down to it. Yeah. Did, did you have exposure to Japanese baseball before or, or anyone who really helped you early on, at least to familiarize you when, when you got there? Well, now, did I have any experience with Japanese baseball? Not really a whole lot prior to this opportunity coming about. Um, but then in that moment, um, like anybody else, I, I'm an information gatherer, and I was very blessed um, to have a number of different people. Um, in fact, I think some of which are on the call. Um, the Thompson family had already been over in Japan, um, had, had been there with, uh, with their company, uh, with IBM, I believe it was, for five years. And there was a mutual friendship actually there back in Atlanta. And they connected us and we were able to talk through what it was like to have lived over there. Um, I reached out to my uncle who had spent a lot of time traveling internationally, wanted to know what that looked like, spent the time I was told I need to read, you got to have law. And you, I had to watch um, Mr. Baseball. Uh, so between the two of those, I was supposed to understand Japanese culture and Japanese baseball a little bit. So <laughs> I did my homework. I did my homework. Yeah. I think that for a lot of people on this call, um, there's that book and that movie where, where everyone's introduction to Japanese baseball for a lot of so, yep. so you're not alone. Um, all right, we I have more questions, but I want to kick it to the audience and I'll just sprinkle mine in as we go since we got some hands raised. Ian, you are up next. Hi, Ian. so it's nice to see another redhead. <laughs> I, I just looked at your Twitter and I saw your five kids in that jumpy house that jump house and your life must be utter chaos. And I commend you. I don't have any kids, but I work with kids. So <laughs> I feel your pain. Uh, so I have we stay busy, two that's questions. For sure. We are busy. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. I have two questions. Um, can you talk, I asked Craig Brazel, for Brazel this, can you talk about the difference between the ball between 2010 and 2011? And can you talk about what fans get more drunk at games, Tigers fans or Cubs fans? Get more what? Drunk. Oh, that's a good question. Okay. All right. So um, first of all, going back just really quickly on that bouncy house that you saw there in the garage, um, the backstory on that is actually that we were hosting a party in Japan for our children, and we went to rent a bounce house. All right. We found out that renting the bounce house was actually more expensive than had we bought a bounce house. So that bounce house was actually purchased while we were in Japan. It was set up in our living room in Japan. You know, we were in an apartment and our kids could get some activity that way. And it's made its way all the way back to the U S it does have some seams that are starting to break, but it's still holding up enough for my baby to get in there. So anyway, backstory on that bounce house is it goes all the way back to Japan. Um, and then in regards to, um, <clears throat> sorry, I know the last question you asked, but the first one was the difference between the ball, correct? Between 10 and 11. Yeah, and, um, uh, I just want to point, so you might, there, there's a website called NPB Stats, and your OPS in 2010 was 894, and are you familiar with WRC Plus? Uh, I am I am not, no, when, it, go ahead. It's like OPS Plus, basically. Yes, yeah. okay, okay. So your, your WRC Plus was 138, and then the okay. next year, your OPS was 762, but your WRC yep. plus was 134. So basically you're pretty much the exact same player, but your OPS was like 132 points less. Like that's how big the difference in the run environment was. Like that's why I asked, because it's such a big difference from one year to the next. So one of the, one of the things I think that um, certainly was, it's just like anything in our life, right? We have these person, we have personality traits, character traits, if you will, that certainly have their, their gold, the, the good aspect of it, and also the shadow aspect of it. Well, I'm, I'm super analytical, um, which helped me when I was competing against guys in a foreign country. I would pay attention to all the little details of what they would do. 
um, and how they would attack me and all these things. I would sit and take notes on it. Um, but with that also comes the fact that you'll sit in your hotel room at night thinking about the coefficient of restitution and why the, why the numbers have changed and how the numbers have changed. And really as an athlete, it comes down to simply competing in the environment. Um, but I will tell you and attest to the fact that I was guilty of worrying about like how the, how the, how the environment had changed. Um, so after the 2010 season, uh, the NPB then decided, which I, you know, I really think at the end of the day, it probably made a lot of sense. Um, they were looking to make a more uniform baseball. Um, because prior to that, there were different uh, manufacturers and each club basically determined which ball it was they were going to use. Um, so certain baseballs had uh, more life to them while other balls did not. And all of that was really dictated based on, uh, I guess, relationships with the clubs or whatever that may have been. Um, so going into 2011, it was, uh, it was um, a season in which they believed they wanted to make a more uniform ball, which completely makes sense, right? A little bit more like the major league. Uh, type standard and there's one baseball for the entire league um, with that and this is where I'm not privy to all of that information but the reality is is that run production was significantly reduced and uh, ERAs and everything else uh, obviously there was a direct correlation between batting averages and run production and how the pitchers were performing and typically what you'll see is when you look at like any set of data right you're always going to have outliers but when the entire whole, right, the, the, the mean, if you will, ends up moving that drastically, something typically is up. Not every, we always used to joke, not every single pitcher had that good of an off season, right? There's just no way they all had that good of an off season. So, uh, yeah, there was some pain for us as hitters because you come into the league and in 10, you kind of get accustomed to a certain thing. And I'm sure it was a lot harder for guys uh, that had been in the league uh, far more than just the one year I had been there. Um, but it was something we had to wrestle with, and it was there was a difference. Um, and whether that was a positive difference or not, that's really not, at the end of the day, that's probably not something I should touch, um, but more or less really about the fact that getting to a uniform ball made sense, right? And then in regards to the Cubs and uh, the Tigers, um, it, 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 here's what I'll tell you. So in, at Wrigley Field, the joke used to be that if you turn the seats around backwards, they would still sell out. Because at the end of the day, they're just there to have a good time, you know? So they're there for the party atmosphere. It's Wrigley Field. They're in Chicago. They're having a good time. And really, you could flip those seats around. And on the reverse of that, and I'll let you be the judge of which one of these is, is, is probably having a better time. On the reverse of that, when I was at Koshien, I was just taken back by the fact that from the first pitch, almost legitimately to the last pitch, it never stopped. And in the outfield, I was trying to like, I was trying to sit there watching the, the, all of the fans in the outfield and trying to like define what that was. And I was like, it's got to be some mix between like Southeastern, like conference uh, college football and like international soccer. But I used to, I used to jokingly say, I wonder who goes home more tired, the players or the fans, because they are just so into it. I feel like the culture of Japan, generally speaking, is very, um, they, they, they toe the line, right? And, they, and, they, and it's very honorable to hold their emotions, which is something that I certainly could have can learn from and still look to and, and engage in that way and try to become better. But I think that was their moment where they could just let it out, you know? Um, so between turning the seats around backwards and going home dog tired from a long nine inning game, I, I, I don't know, maybe you'll be the judge of that. Thanks, Ian. All right. Uh, Chad, you're up next. Hey, Chad. And you have to go right to the Cubs fan there to defend <laughs> yeah. himself on this. Yeah, what do you say to that? Although I, I, I was 25 in 2006, and you know, we were all pretty drunk in the bleachers back then. So, <laughs> so Matt, Matt's probably right right on that one. But um, th thanks for thanks for uh, doing this, Matt. Um, yeah, man. You were one of my first favorite players uh, post Moneyball uh, when it comes to analytics and everything. And uh, one of the few that actually took walks in the mid two thousand Cubs, so it was. Uh, it I was. was I was a little bit. I was a little bit before my time. I guess. Yeah, yeah you, you definitely were. You. Yeah. I mean, maybe the maybe maybe if you had Joe Madden as manager instead of Lou Pinella, yeah. you would have had a. Uh, you've been appreciated more there. But but you know what? Going back to that though, man, there's a plan for everyone, and it was intended. Sure. I I love my time in Chicago, but it was intended for me to be in Japan. But anyway, go ahead. Well, uh, my wife and I went to Japan in uh, 2018. I went to Koshien and became Tigers fans uh, from there. Um, and I know you just you just started talking about it, but 
I was, I was meaning to ask you about Wrigley and Koshien and the differences and similarities of playing there in these old ballparks that maybe don't necessarily have the most updated amenities. How does that affect you as a player to play in, in you, know, you know, when you go play at a new ballpark and you have, you know, the top of the, you know, top of the line training stuff, you have the batting cages and everything. But when you go to Koshien or Wrigley, you have these kind of these cramped quarters or you might not have. I know at Wrigley, they've changed it a bunch in the last couple of years, but you know, they had, their players were always complaining about not having the same kind of facilities. How does that affect you in your preparation or does it affect you um, and the other players going forward? Yeah, for sure. So the one good thing was, is that I, I mean, and, and in my going over and transitioning over into Japan, I, I could not have been in a handful of maybe at one or a few environments like back in the U S that would have prepared me for what I was about to face. And the fact that I had been a Cub and had faced the media in Chicago and had dealt with all of the fans in such a positive way, right? But there's also, like, it's like anything else. In, in Chicago or whether it's Japan or anywhere else, they want their teams to win, right? So, like, when you're playing well, they love you. And when you're not, they're going to let you know. And so the good thing was is that I, at least um, from having experience playing in Chicago, I knew what it, I had an idea what it would be like in a sense. I was somewhat prepared for it. Uh, with that being said, um, so I, I kind of, my point in saying that was that I really enjoyed the, the history of the ballpark. Like it, it started to become like this thing, like, you know, you get to, you get to, uh, go back and look at old footage of Chicago and, and some of the old games that were played there, uh, even pre, uh, like the lights going in, I think the lights were in in maybe 88, 88. August, 88. August 8th, 88. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I used to love going back. So when I get to, when I get to uh, Japan, the one thing about Japan that I didn't love that they changed about Koshien was they got rid of the lucky zone. So there was this lucky zone that was at Koshien that was in the gaps and they got rid of it. So for a hitter, it just, it felt like it was unfair that we didn't get to play in that. But anyway, um, so you walk down the halls of Koshien, there's a picture, like an old, like, you know, probably replica picture, obviously of Babe Ruth and the time that he had been there. And you see the history of the, of the high school tournament. So the, I say all that because the history of a building to me means so much, right? So whether you're playing in the most fancy stadium or not, I personally enjoy the, the, the history behind a ballpark, right? Now, the part that you're kind of attesting to that actually does matter is like back at Wrigley Field, uh, when I was playing there, we used to have a, um, our clubhouse was pretty narrow and small. And as a guy who maybe was coming in off the bench, all we had was like a little net that barely had enough room to actually take a full swing and a tee. So you're getting ready to go out and face, you know, 95 to 98 miles an hour late in the game and get a hit. And your ability to warm up amounts to like a half swing off a tee. Whereas now in more modern stadiums, they have full batting cages. You can run around, you can move around. There's a lot more uh, advantages to how you can prepare your body for competition. So that does, that does play in um, the, the, the aspects of the facilities in preparation for the sport more than the comfort of the sport, right? And at Koshien, the one thing I will say is that I was fortunate enough for the majority of my career there to be starting. So it was all about pregame preparation. The one thing that Koshien had that was amazing, and I think it went back to uh, Kei Agawa, if I'm correct. But when he signed, I believe it was, to come over and play for the Yankees, they get back at that time, they were getting these nice chunks of money um, in terms of like a posting fee. And the Tigers were uh, willing to reinvest that money back into their club. So we had this indoor facility that was attached by like a breezeway of sorts. Like almost like you would have to think of it almost like a jet bridge on a, on a plane. But we would, we would be connected to this indoor facility that was phenomenal. Um, so, yes, facilities matter. But we could get all kinds of work in there when it was raining. And, you know, Japan, there's plenty of rain. Um, it's like being down in South Florida. Um, but, yes, to answer your question, it does matter. Um, but – Again, it matters more in preparation than it does comfort. Great. And thanks for being yep. involved with the 2016 Cubs. Yeah, man. Thank you. That was fun. I mean, I wish I would have had a little bit more involvement, but I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And I really was excited. I had a chance to be with some of those younger players that year in 16 in Iowa to see them get to go up and contribute to be a part of that team. That was really cool. Yeah. And congrats to the Cubs fans. Oh. Ometato. Ometato. Do you know what Ometato is? Uh, no. In Japanese. Oh well, thank okay. you, Matt. There well, you I was go. I was a yeah. season ticket holder that year, so I went to all the playoff games. Did all the it was it was an experience. That's Definitely awesome. Experience. Yeah, Thanks, man. Matt. Yep. Thanks, Chad. That's a good question. All right, uh, Ted, you're up next. 
Hi, Matt. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is, I have two questions. One is, what was your best day you've ever had as a player? And the other question is, when you're in a slump and everybody gets in a slump, what do you do to get out of it? Mm, those are good questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to separate, if it's okay, I'm going to separate my career in the U.S. and my career in Japan in terms of like my best day. Um, in the United States, uh, I thought it was, it was really cool uh, to have been able to participate in the playoff games. Uh, it, it's hard to say that, though, in some ways, because we, we didn't fare so well in those games. Um, but that was really special um, just to have had that experience. Um, certainly opening day, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, the first day that you, you get called to the major leagues, you'll never forget that moment, what it's like to get a phone. I was at a day's in in Kodak, Tennessee, which is uh, severe volts, East Tennessee. And it was, uh, I remember getting the phone call and standing on the balcony and hearing that I was going to go play in the big leagues. And I don't think it really fully sunk in. Um, I, I do remember trying to figure out, do I need to shave or cut my hair or how do I need to present myself and getting no sleep? And anyway, it was, uh, it, it's something you'll never forget. And then in Japan, I mean, there are so many different memories um, that were amazing, but I will say the one that probably stands out the most to me um, was uh, in 2014 um, when we were playing in the Tokyo Dome in the Climax Series final. And uh, they're obviously one of our big rivals there in Japan. Um, they usually had, had a tendency to have the upper hand with us. Um, and so for us to be able to go in there and collectively as a unit be able to win that game and then see the emotions of all of the fans in the stadium uh, that were there to support us. Because our support in Japan was amazing, uh, no matter where we went with the Tigers. And to see the, the, see the emotions of the fans and just to have this sense of like we did it together, uh, especially given the idea of WA within Japan, um, it was just really cool, uh, really special. And I'll never forget that day. Unfortunately, it didn't go so well with the Hawks. Um, but anyway, I'll never forget the day that we won in Tokyo Dome and we we're all celebrating together. And what was the other day? Well, sorry, was there one other question? I apologize. Yeah, oh, what, when you're in a slump. batting slump, what do you do? Uh, well, you pray a little bit harder. Um, you go to the cage probably a little bit more. Um, you know, I was, there were some trying times for me in Japan. Uh, I did, I was very fortunate to have a lot of success, but there was, in 2012 was a very difficult season. Uh, 15, the last year I was there, uh, I felt like I was fighting against it the entire season. Um, and a lot of times for me, it was like staying up late at night, watching videos, constantly analyzing everything that was going on, almost to a fault. So I think sometimes when you get into a slump, one of the best things you can do is, is almost just like go back to being a kid and go out there and compete and just give it and literally lay it out on the field. Because my mind, super analytical, I'm always trying to figure out the why's where sometimes it's probably better if I would have just gone out and played, you know, but anyway. It, it, I, in fact, you know what? I think you can tell by my answer there. I still probably don't have a good answer, which <laughs> means that if you can figure that out for me, please let me know. And maybe I can share it with a kid one day. You know? No, I like that answer because I play yeah. softball, senior softball, and I know what it's like when you're in a slump. If mm. you think about it more, you're going to do even worse. So I don't even mm. think about it. Just go out there and play. So I like your advice. There we go. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Uh, this maybe isn't your wasn't your favorite day in Japan, but I want to share this video and ask you a follow up question on it. Mm. All right, let's see. You got me nervous. No, no, it's a good one. Okay. Right. Is the sound on? Shoot, maybe it is. Sorry if the sound's off in that shot. All right. I imagine that must be the best feeling in the world, or at least the best feeling in sports. Can you just tell us what it's like? Just like walk us through, like, I don't know, when, do, like, the ball coming off the bat or touching home, like, what sticks with you and what is that feeling like hitting a walk up, sayonara home run? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Makita, on the guy that was pitching in that particular game he was actually the starter 
Um, and that was, I believe, probably the fourth, probably the fourth time I'd been to the plate off of them in that game. And I do not believe I had had a, a hit um, to that point. Um, but Makita San was one of those guys that was kind of a unique case because most of the time when you face guys that are like sidearm right-hand pitchers, uh, the tendency is that you uh, have to really focus on hitting to the backside of the field. And throughout that entire game, I felt like I was jamming myself over and over and over again and just hitting like, you know, weaker balls to the right side. Well, you know, when you jam yourself sometimes or you hit the ball at the end, you'll, you'll put a little crack in your bat, right? And in this particular at bat, it was probably the fourth time I'd been up. And I remember looking down. I used to have this routine, especially in big moments. I would look up at the facade and there was this T-O-T-K up there. And that's another story. And I would also look down here and they had like the little NPB logo that was like a sticker that they would place on my bat to, to say that they were approved because they were from the U.S. And I remember looking, I would always look down at that sticker and kind of have like a focal point. I had to focus on something here so that I could then like uh, take my focus from, from the bat to the, to the pitcher. So it was all this mind game about how I was focusing. I remember looking down and I saw like a little crack in the bat. And this is in the middle of the A-B. In fact, it was the pitch before. And I looked down, I'm like, you know, I can't hit with this bat. So I asked for time. I run back to the dugout. I give it to Kazuhito Okisan, who is our translator. I get the new bat. I run up there. And now I'm at a place where, like, I don't even have really the whole lot of time to think. Going back to the whole slump thing, like, thinking for me sometimes got me in trouble. So I don't have time to think. I get up there. And I'm like, you know what? Forget this. I'm not going to try to hit the ball to the backside off Makita. I'm just going to swing it. And he had probably fatigued a little bit, and he left the ball over the plate, and my approach had changed, and I was fortunate enough to get the barrel on it. And I don't know that I had a lot of hits against him, but I did have one right there, and it was really special. I mean, when you're running around those bases and you know your team has won the game, there's really not a feeling quite like it, to be honest with you. Um, hitting a home run is amazing, but then to do it and celebrate it with, your, with all of your team and the coaches and certainly the stadium, um, it's really cool. It's really special. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good. That's a great background there. I like that. Um, all right. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Mark Cates, you're up next. Hey, Mark. You're still on mute. You had to unmute yourself. Here we go. There hey, go. Matt. Um, really Hi. an honor to uh, meet you um, this way anyway. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we have a couple of people in common. Uh, Michael Zagaris and Theo Epstein, probably among many others. And also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I was at that insane game in Wareham when you guys won the Cape League Championship in the bottom of the ninth. Um, yes, my, those are some good memories. <laughs> I can only imagine. It's it's so much fun just to go for you guys. I, I, I can't even imagine. And, that, and that's a dynasty for those that don't know. Um, so um, my question is, you were part of one of the most notorious trades in Red Sox history. And um, it was so dramatic because the established star of the team, Nomar, as well as you, went to the Cubs on August 1st, if memory serves. It happened to be a really memorable day in my family's life for other reasons. But I'm um, just wondering what your memories are of that and what it was like. And um, you, I mean, you weren't really in Boston, I don't think, but you were, you were part of the Red Sox. And anyway, we all know what, well, it's 2004 for those that uh, um, aren't aware. Anyway, I, I was just curious about that. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I actually signed my professional contract with the Boston Red Sox July the 8th of 2003. And at that time, and I believe this rule has now been uh, abolished, but I do think that at that time, the rule was that you had to be with the, with the club that drafted you for at least one calendar year before they could trade you. So I was, I was, I was uh, signed on July the 8th of 03, and July the 31st at the trade deadline, uh, of 2004, I was traded. So essentially, almost as soon as I could have been traded, I was traded. So with that, I didn't even get through my first full season uh, before that happened. And, um, and so for me, it was kind of a realization. I remember I was in, uh, I was in Dunedin, uh, I believe at the time in Florida, I was playing in the Florida State League, I was playing with the, Sar the Sarasota Red Sox at the time. Uh, they since have moved out of that league. But um, I was down there with a uh, plane and I remember getting this phone call that I was traded and uh, I was going to, I was going to go be a part of the uh, Chicago Cubs. And uh, it was, I really, I was taken back by it, to be honest with you. What was really crazy though, was that like any baseball fan, um, the Red Sox and the Yankees have always been big, but during that time period with the history 
of the Red Sox and not having won and all of what was going on, it was really, really big. And I believe it was in 03 the year before that I was sitting there watching Aaron Boone hit a home run um, that essentially sank the Red Sox um, in 2003 and, um, and just being such a big fan of the game. And now here I am getting traded with the guy, Nomar Garcia Parra, who was bigger than life in Boston for a very long time. And uh, not only that, but had Georgia Tech roots where I had, where I had gone to school. Um, so it was really kind of surreal, to be honest with you. I, I think, again, I was so young. I was only uh, 24 years old, or excuse me, um, I was only uh, 22 years old, I guess it was at the time, that it's really hard to process all of that. Um, but what I do- It was hard for us we were, too. Yeah, we were traded <laughs> and they won. That's what it came down to. We were traded and they won. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't have a whole lot to do with that, obviously. Um, but yes, it was certainly a unique part of my story and certainly- uh, could have been uh, a part of that story that ultimately uh, was going to land me in Japan, you know. Right on. Well, as a Tigers yeah. fan, I'm grateful for that. And uh, again, great to see you. Cool. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, Mark. All right. All right going from one Tigers jersey to another one. Trevor, you're up. All right. Well, uh, as always, good to see you, Matt. And uh, I, right, I've got... Right. I've always got like dozens of questions for you, but I'll just stick to one. Uh, I want to ask you about hero interviews in Japan. Um, so it's kind of a two part question. The first one is, um, when do you start thinking about that? Like during the game, if you get like a late clutch hit, are you already kind of thinking like, I might be called up after the game or do you wait till like the, the third out of the bottom of the ninth to kind of process that and someone gives you the call like, hey, you're up um, and then what types of questions did you enjoy being asked and what types of questions did you kind of feel like you weren't left with a lot to say, or it was really hard to, to get something going on that podium? Yeah, for sure. So um, thank you for the question. It's good to see you. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, it's really hard during the competition. The one thing I will say that I felt like I always did a decent job of I was present in the moment. Um, so it's really hard to think about like, you know, what, but the bottom line is, is that when the game concludes and you have won, uh, I mean, I think every athlete would admit to the fact that at that moment, once the game is finally over, you're kind of thinking, oh, I had a pretty good game or maybe I did this or that. And so there's the potential that I'm going to go up there on that hero interview uh, stand. But the way it worked for us was that Oki-san, who was there in the dugout, would always inform us. Um, and sometimes it would, it, you know, sometimes we would find out almost immediately as soon as the game was completing. Um, and then uh, it was always a lot of fun, um, especially as you became uh, more kind of, I guess you would say, accustomed to getting up there. Um, and for me, I guess the longer I was there, I started, I tried, and I wasn't very good at it, but I tried to incorporate some Japanese, you know? And the beauty in incorporating Japanese is that my Japanese uh, um, a vocabulary is very limited or was very limited. So when it comes to answering questions, I would get away with very simplistic answers. So I, I could kind of manipulate my way through uh, an interview in that way by just saying something Japanese and, and moving on. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was always funny because there was some kind of cadence to it. And whenever we would watch, like, especially Japanese athletes get on the stand, it always felt like this, like similar type response over and over and over again um yeah. so if anything we were hoping i was at least hoping to like give something a little bit different um but yeah i enjoyed it i would say that some of the hardest questions um some of the hardest questions to be honest did not happen on that hero stand it would it would tend to occur after in that tunnel <laughs> those were the tough ones um but yeah the hero stand usually the game you had won the game uh, you obviously, to get up there, it had some sort of a good game uh, in some way or, or another. And so it was usually pretty lighthearted. But yeah. Can, cool, thanks. Um, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Do you know who decides who gets to get, who gets called up to the podium? Like, is it the club? Is it the media? Is it, do you know? What, what would be, what, what do you think? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an answer. I'm not trying to skate around it. But what would be your guess on that? What do you think it is? I would guess it's the club. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I... I I, I, I would say that that's probably pretty fair. I do think that the club and the media certainly have, uh, like, anywhere. Like, look, I don't care where you are. Like, that's, that's the way it works, you know. Like, I think there's relationship there. But um, yeah. generally speaking, I would say, yes, the club is probably the one dictating, dictating that. Maybe the media. Maybe, I mean, sorry, maybe the uh, PR department. Maybe the PR right. department's deciding that. 
yeah, but I'm not 100% certain. All I know is that Oki san would come down and he'd be like, you're the hero tonight. You need to go up on the stand. Yes, sir. Hi, wakari machita. All right. So because different TV stations would be hosting these games or broadcasting the games, and it was usually one of the broadcasters or someone from that station that would do the hero interview, correct? Like it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't was, a, a Tigers PR guy. It was actually someone from that particular media. Is that right? So here's what we need to figure out. <laughs> you want to really get some PI work going. We need to figure out based upon the particular TV station that's covering the game on that particular day, do they have any kind of tendencies towards who it is they t- tend to, who they choose, right? And then we oh. can start to figure out, hey, is it the TV that's actually doing this or is it somebody else? Because uh, certain stations might have certain tendencies. So if you get those foreigners up on the stand, maybe there's a station that's more willing to put those foreigners up there. I don't know. I don't know. Could be, could be. Little yeah. conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, never know. <laughs> Trevor, we'll look forward to your deep dive on, on that subject on, on your yes. website. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right. All right, Toshiki, you're up next. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you. Hi, hey, Matt. Uh, it's truly an honor to be able to ask you a question, uh, even though I'm a Giants fan. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I understand you are uh, an analytics guy, uh, as I am as well. And uh, uh, if you could you talk a little bit about some of the downsides of being analytic, analytical and how would you adjust that to, to your players? Yeah, so I think when you speak of analytics, like there's a lot of different ways we could try to define, right? And I, I think that like, if you were to try to, I've been going through this more recently with like some leadership type training and not to say that this is the end all be all, but like, I think that anal- people that are super analytical tend to lead from the mind quadrant, right? And so um, they, in leading in the mind quadrant, the thing is, is that uh, sometimes the, the, the pitfalls of that is that Um, you become, you can become very narrow. Um, You can become like really have this tunnel vision um, of what it is that you're trying to accomplish, um, uh, you know, from time to time, because everything's so black and white to you. Um, It's one plus one equals two. And that's why I love math because it just made sense. You know, there wasn't, it was, it seemed to be really uh, objective in its in its analysis. Right. Um, And so I think with that, you have to, you have to, and I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out, but like, you have to be able to um, recognize that sometimes it's not always as easy as one plus one equals two. Right. And there are people that think differently and um, don't see things through the same lens that we see them through. And how can we meet those people where they are? So like in teaching and coaching, it's understanding different personalities and recognizing that yes, while this may be a strength, it can also be a detriment to me if I don't manage it correctly. And so I always am trying to work more in recently and how can I, how can I utilize that as a strength and while still recognize this other quadrant, this heart quadrant or relational quadrant to where I don't get so focused on the, the analytics of whatever it is that I'm walking through that I lose sight of the relationship that's right next to me, you know, and I always enjoyed people. I always enjoyed my teammates. I enjoyed all those things. But part of, I think what made me, successful in the game was that I did have the ability to really lock in on what was in front of me. And I could, I would see nothing else, but what was right in front of me. And so the, the only detriment to that is that sometimes along those, uh, when you're going down that track, you start to lose sight of things that really matter. And, and for me, looking back, hindsight's 2020, it's easy to see situations where it's like, man, I guess I could have handled that a little differently. I wish I would have done that a little better. So I don't know if that answers your question, but like more or less, I think it's just understanding who you are, understanding who I am, uh, why I was created or made that way. And then how can I more efficiently or uh, more productively utilize that as a strength while also recognizing this part of me that I can grow in? Is that, is that even what you were asking? But uh, anyway. Yes. Uh, well, I, I guess I was asking from a uh, coach's perspective. Uh, I'm not a Yeah, and I think... Much. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's where I think like analytics. So like I've been into a room even as early as this past year and you sit down in a room and you start to, again, because you're analytical, you start to present your case or you present, you know, uh, your, um, you you present uh, your, like your PowerPoint presentation from the mind of somebody who's very analytical. And I would sit in the back of the room and I would watch half of the room glaze over. These are athletes. 
half of these guys don't really have a clue what you're saying or do they don't, they don't really care. You know what I mean? And so I think it's just the awareness. I think awareness is a big part of it. Understanding which athletes you can, you can approach in that way, understanding that, okay, while this data might be super useful and it might be something that I can really help these guys with, I need to get it down into layman's terms. I need to figure out how I can utilize this to help them without having to go directly to them with the analytics. Does that, so I think it's just managing personalities and that's where it goes back to awareness and just understanding that we're not all the same, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Toshiki. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, Theo Epstein when you mentioned that you were facing Makita for the fourth or fifth time, because I know he wouldn't have let that happen. But now that Toshiki asked about the, about asked his question, I got to ask about Theo Epstein and and what your impression was of him as a leader in a in a baseball mind uh, when you worked with him with the Cubs. Yeah, for sure. I think obviously Theo has uh, cemented his place in the game, right? Um, he has been fortunate enough to, uh, based, based upon obviously a lot of hard work, um, uh, certainly skill uh, involved. And then I'm, and I'm sure he would probably attest to, he, he surrounded himself as many people who are successful do with a lot of really good people. Um, but he has turned around, he took two franchises um, that hadn't won in a long time and uh, Um, okay. Well, you were you were talking about Theo Epstein, but I did have one follow up on that because he had a, he's in a pretty unique position where now where he's tasked with improving the on field product of MLB. If you were in his shoes, do you have any uh, any things any of your pet projects that you'd like to implement on the major league level? Wow, yeah, um, I think he's probably more uh, he's more versed in being able to answer that, but I. Um, you know what? Here's the hard thing with the game. Uh, it, the hard thing with the game today is that I believe in some ways we live in a microwave culture, right? Everybody wants it now. Like technology has made it such that like everything is, all of our information is, is, is so much more readily available and, and everything that our life has sped up, right? And what is it about the game, right? About the game of baseball that traditionally speaking, so much of us have loved or those that love the game have loved, right? The history of the game and the nuances between the, the, the matchup between the pitcher and the hitter and like the cat and mouse game between counts and situations throughout the game. And the fact that it's timeless in the sense that there's no clock, right? Like there's so many things about the game that has made the playing catch in the front yard with dad or whomever it was and, and going out and, 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 and enjoying the competition of the game, but the, you know, certainly the history of the game and all of those things. And so, you know, culturally speaking, we have, we are transitioning further and further away from that old timeless type value to more of a, you know, I need it now, you know, and kids today are inundated with technologies. My own are to the point where it's just for, um, for mine, I guess, specifically, like so much of who we are, right. Is about like, environment by which we grow up in so because they grew up around the game there's still an interest in the game they still see value in the game but like generally speaking for the average fan or the average person um it's kind of boring to a lot of people so i know the game they're looking for ways to speed it up to make it have more of a flair you know whatever it is um i do think to answer your question i do think that if they can find a way to put a contact if they can find a way to value contact again in the game to put a premium on putting the ball in play and creating more action, I do think the game uh, will be uh, more enjoyable, right? I do think that when you come to the three true outcomes of walk, homer, and strike out, like you can only do that so long before the game really slows down. Um, so finding a way, and, and I've heard different ways that that could potentially be, um, you could try to meet that um, goal, um, but finding a way to make contact more of a, pre again, and even in how we value players, um, it's just it, that that aspect in the game is being lost. And I think that if you can find a way to bring that back, I do think that the game becomes a little bit more interesting. Uh, and then marketing, which they do a phenomenal job with, but continue to market and grow the game, um, you know, throughout the world. I think the WBC, uh, obviously they're looking to accomplish that. Um, and just, it, it's really about education. It's about educating the younger kids, uh, making it available. Um, allowing them to understand the values that come through the game and why it's fun to play 
And it's just really about edu- I, I really think you got to do it. If you're really going to do it, you got to do it from the underbelly, which is the kids. You got to you got to make them want to do it again. You've got to give them avenues by which they can do it and uh, make it fun. And then if you can grow that the game from that base, that's how it was, right? I feel like so many of us love it because we all played it when we were little and we did it with dad or whomever it was. And we all loved the game because we all experienced it. So I think it's a matter of getting young kids to experience it again. And then the Padres this year certainly seem like a fun team. The Dodgers have been a fun team. The Cubs have been for a long time. There's a lot of great teams, but there's some teams that are coming out now with some players that are a little different, maybe a little different than they were in the past. And maybe that'll help the younger generation too. Yeah. 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 They, I know that um, in all the studies they've done about, um, getting more fans. The the one um, indicator that's strongest of whether or not someone's a baseball fan as an adult is whether or not they played as a kid. So there you go. Boom. That's that's the that's the ticket. And I agree with the contact thing. But until the powers that be figure out how to incentivize contact, all of us on the call just remind your friends that are complaining about that. Just pay attention to the Japanese game where there is a lot of contact. <laughs> sure. And then come with us on the Japan ball tour if you want to see it for yourself. All right, let's, yeah. get, let's get to the, uh, the questions here. Yumi, you're up next. Hi, Yumi. Hi. Um, first of all, Matt, I think you're so brave. I grew up in Japan, bo- born and grew up in Japan, but uh, living in the Kansai area, like dialects totally different for me. It's so foreign rather than, you know, English. And the Kansai band, like if somebody yell at you, I get so scared and you played. And so I don't know how much you understood Japanese when you were playing with people are screaming, but um, it, it's amazing. Um, um, I did not watch because I, I moved to the States when I was kind of like younger and I did not really watch NPB and I'm really watching uh, Major League Baseball. But the last couple of years, I'm really into um, Japanese baseball um, uh, from YouTube and like uh, the news highlights like I can watch especially the spring uh, training this uh, this year I'm watching almost every single day so I know more Japanese baseball than uh, American baseball and and also ex Japanese players beca- becoming uh, YouTubers and they talk about the foreign players and how they succeed. And then you mentioned that um, how you adapt the, the you know foreign culture and the practice. Those are the ones who made it. And also that those YouTuber um, um, ex players always ask these questions. And I wanted to ask you, like I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. As a batter, uh, who was your favorite pitcher to face and um, favorite, you know, uh, player at the pitcher that you faced? Maybe like you can name a, a couple of people. Sure, for, for sure. So, um, you know, what was really interesting in, in the United States, whenever you would face a guy, you would you had watched them on TV, many of them, especially the time I'd come up. So there was this kind of this aura around them. Um, when you were in Japan, you didn't really have a sense or a know about the majority of more of the elite uh, pitchers there. Now, some of them you did, certainly, but you didn't know them as well. So you didn't have you hadn't grown up in the culture of having watched them. So you didn't have there was no like added like layer there in Japan as compared to the U.S. So I remember in the U.S., I, I the time I came up, I faced Roger Clemens and I faced even though it wasn't a lot of at bats, it was Roger Clemens and Tom Glavin and John Smoltz. And uh, I remember facing like Roy Oswalt and Don Trouble. I mean, just you go across Andy Pettit. Like there was just so many guys. I remember sitting on the couch as a kid and watching Andy Pettit stare over his glove in the playoffs of the Yankees. And now I'm facing him. Um, that's just, there's, there's an element there that, that maybe you don't get when you go over and compete in Japan. Um in Japan, I always loved uh, competing with Sugano-san for the Giants. Uh, I felt like he um, was willing to fill up the strike zone. Um, he wanted to he wanted to throw the ball over the plate. Darvish was much the same way uh, at the beginning of my time there. Um, he was very willing to attack the strike zone. Um, and then, you know, so anytime you're competing against guys that want to come after you, it's just it's fun. You know, it's just a good competition. Uh, and then. Um, in terms of guys that I didn't love facing, Asao-san, he was, in fact, I believe, 
And so one of the seasons, maybe 2011 or 12, as a reliever, I think he was close to MVP or was MVP. Uh, he threw he threw like 155 kilometers an hour and had a really good fork ball. And it was just herky-jerky and just not fun. I don't ever remember. Most any time I would face a pitcher, I felt uh, confident enough to believe that I was going to somehow succeed. And with him, I never felt fully comfortable. He always made me feel a little funny, like something was up, you know. So Asao was probably one of the more difficult ones I ever faced in Japan. So was it a difficult, like, um, strike zone? Was it different from the, you know, U.S. to Japan? Like, did you have to adjust the, the strike zone? And a pitcher always, like, tried to, like, a Japanese pitcher tried to, to throw the ball uh, when the count is, is not favorable for the pitcher. They always tried to throw lower, um, how to say it, like a lower corner? Yes, 100%. Um, e course right? They got to throw that, get yeah. that ball right on the corner. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would, so I've obviously analytical and I, and I talk and whatever, but I, 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 at first, when I first was in Japan, I thought the strike zone was, was bigger. Um, and then I started to question. And the reason I started to question was, is it truly bigger or are these Japanese pitchers just that much better at throwing it in that same location repeatedly to the point where mm -hmm. eventually it gets called. And so I, I, I still don't know the exact answer there, but what I would say is generally speaking, the Japanese pitchers are taught to pitch on the edge of the strike zone. Um, they're taught to try to get you to expand. In fact, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard there was a study once done that the Japanese kids that played video games, they threw many more balls as video game baseball players than the American kids did um, because it's strike to ball and ball to strike. So everything is like, 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 uh, you know, it's kind of like smoke and mirrors, right? Where they're going to make you think it's the strike and get you to expand or vice versa. Whereas the U.S. it's more like we're going to attack the plate and then we're going to expand, depending on the situation. So to, to answer your question, yes, I felt like it was wider. I thought it was very difficult to hit in Japan uh, once you were identified as a guy that needed to be slowed down within the lineup. And I think that part of the reason why it felt like a bigger strike zone, in all fairness to the umpires, was that I think so the Japanese pitchers, again, to go back to it more readily, were able to hit that spot over and over and over again, that eventually they're going to get called. Whereas in the U.S., they might, they might throw it there once in the bat, and they might be doing it three times in Japan. Whereas of those three pitches, maybe they start getting strikes called. You know, so I just think it's the repetitive nature of how they entered the strike zone that allowed them to, and the catchers. The catchers were really good at keeping the way they framed it. Um, so there was a lot of factors at play. I'm not suggesting it was easy for the umpires, but yes. And the other thing too, is when you're in the U S and you're not in the middle of the order, they're throwing the ball over the plate more. As soon as you get to a position where you're the guy, now they're throwing everything on the edge of the plate. So that's a whole nother story. But yes, I did think it was a little bit tougher in Japan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's you me. Good question. Yeah. All right. Dennis cross. You're You're up next. Hey, Dennis. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I must have hit the wrong button because I have no question. I'm just listening. Oh, really? No worries. Yeah. All right. You had your hand up, but hello. Yeah, Good to see you. Sorry about that. No worries. We just wanted to see all your impressive uh, diplomas on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> My home office. All right. Okay. Uh, Craig Katz, then. You're up. Hey, Craig. Hi. Uh, I was just curious, especially when you mentioned uh, about uh, learning a little bit of Japanese and answering in, in Japanese for those interviews. Do the teams actively try and get the foreigners to learn Japanese? And if so, how do they help you with that? Or do they not even expect that? Uh, yeah, so I can obviously speak to the Tigers in my time that I was there, right? I don't know exactly. I did we talk to other teammates. Uh, or, or excuse me, other other friends within the league. But um, for us, for the most part, um, to sum that up is I'll never forget the day that I arrived and they gave us a tour of the building that we were going to be living in and um, the people that were in place to help support us and all of the, uh, you know, you can figure it, you can figure all that out, dot the I's, cross the T's on everything. And I remember um, the, the, the gentleman, uh, Toru-san, who is in charge of the international department, 
um, looking over at me and I was like, man, I'm just so amazed at how well you guys are trying to take care of us and all of this. And I'm so grateful and whatnot. And he looks back at me and he goes, it's exactly right. He goes, there's absolutely no excuse for you not to perform well on the field. So, you know, I think that, I think that with that, I think that in terms of the Japanese aspect and learning the language, um, I, they, they had so many things in place for us to feel comfortable that it was easy for us not to. In addition to the fact that the Japanese students in high school learn English, many of the, most of the major cities, they, there's people that can speak English. And so it makes it really easy not to, but I did try to learn some because I did want to try to avoid how I was having a third party involved. Um, right. And I got to a place where I was, nah, nah, I wasn't ever really good at it, let's be honest, but I could at least say something to them other than having to use a translator. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, man. Thanks, Greg. I think you were better than most, Matt. That's why you, that's partly why you stuck uh, around. So props to you. All right. Um, Susan, you're up. Hi. Hi, Susan. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thanks, Shane, for organizing as always. And uh, thank you, Matt, for joining us. Um, at the beginning of your talk, Matt, you talked about how you would um, advise MLB players of what to do and expect in Japan. What's your reverse? How would you advise MPB players who are about to come to the States to play MLB? Sure, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, there's a few things, I guess, uh, you know, whether you're talking about hitters or pitchers specifically, I think we've seen that history has told us that the, the pitchers have historically done better than the hitters, I think on, on average. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense uh, because really when you look at it, pitching, there's a lot less variables involved. Uh, it's really that you are the one that is dictating the pace of the game and you're throwing to a catcher. Whereas for the hitters, they're obviously the game is, is, is predicated on variables, you know, changing speeds and locations and count, leveraging counts and, and, and whatnot. And so I would say for most of the athletes from a physical standpoint that come from Japan to the U.S., um, there's a few things that occur. Number one, one of the biggest struggles I had when I first got to Japan that I had to work through in, in spring training was the reality that a lot of pitchers in Japan have hesitations within their windup. So they're constantly pausing or stopping or changing the pace at which they deliver the baseball. So for a guy that in the U S that's used to like a cadence of like a pitcher lifting his leg and delivering the ball, you kind of get used to that. And all of a sudden now your body is prepared to hit and the ball's not there yet. Right. So a lot of Japanese hitters have these like gathering points, I would say within their swings um, that help them combat that style of pitching. And when they get to the U S they tend to not get their foot down in time. Um, so they need to learn how to more efficiently, uh, get on time with the pitch. And then the other part is they have to really rewire their brain. Um, and even for me coming back in 16, um, I had to spend time in Iowa while I was there just trying to rewire my brain because I was told for the last six years that you should never expect a fastball in this situation. You know, they're probably going to get you to chase like all of the above. And now all of a sudden they're throwing a fastball and you foul it off. And then you expect there to be an off-speed pitch coming and they keep throwing a fastball. And you're like, I don't understand. Why are you doing this? And so even for somebody who had played in the U S for as long as I had before I left, I had to go through that. So you can only imagine for a guy that had never been over here. So I think it's a combination of like rewiring the brain and also, and how you think and how you approach counts and situations. And then also physically changing um, some of which, how you lift your leg, how you get it back down and so forth, if that makes sense. Great, thank you so much. Yep. Very interesting, thank you. All right, we have two hands raised. Um, last call for questions. Um, and then uh, I don't wanna keep Matt for too much longer here. Um, we have one question in the chat I wanna relay since Russ can't, um, can't get off of mute right now because he has a baby sleeping. Um, what are your favorite parks in, in the big, in major league baseball and NPB? Sure. Uh, Wrigley, obviously, because it was my home ballpark. Um, Florida was special to me. It was the place that I saw my first professional game as a kid and the place that I played my first professional game. It was the old, like, it used to be Joe Robbie stadium. Then it was pro player stadium. They don't even have the same place anymore. It, that only holds that value to me because of my, my past or whatnot. 
Uh, 08 was a really tough year for me, but I, I did have a chance to play an old Yankee Stadium, go out to Monument Park and check it out, which is really cool. And then you can't – it's really hard to not mention Dodger Stadium. I don't know. There's something about the Dodger Dogs and being in, out in California and, and whatnot that was really cool. Uh, in in Japan, um, obviously, Koshien, being your home ballpark, it's, it was amazing, the history there. And uh, outside of uh, – I love playing in the Tokyo Dome because the energy in that ballpark when the Tigers and Giants were meeting each other was insane um, and a lot of fun. And it was a great place to hit, right? Um, and then, obviously, the Tokyo – is this Jingu. I don't know why, but Jingu always it, – it, Jingu seemed to be that place for me in Japan. Either something really good was going to happen or something really bad was going to happen. Like, there was, like, really no in-between. So that stadium, like, has a lot of memories in it for me. Um, but those are probably the three three main ones off the top of my head. Cool. Um, all right, Ian, going back to you. So you broke Ichiro's hit record in 2010. And I, want, I was wondering, like, how did it feel breaking that record? What was it like being a foreigner breaking that record? And then how much do you hate Shogo Akiyama that he broke your record? Okay, so first of all, I don't have any remorse, or any, any hate, excuse me, for, um, for Akiyama. Uh, good for him. I'm, I honestly was surprised at the end of that year that he did it. The run that he went on at the end was insane um, to, to get there. Um, but good for him. And, uh, and that's, what, I mean, that's the reality of it, right? They're, they're meant to be broken. Um, but when it came down to uh, myself uh, there in, in 2010, um, you know, I, I, I did hear all of the stories, right, about um, former foreign players like Alex Cabrera. Uh, I believe it was Tuffy Rhodes, maybe, um, who on different occasions had a chance to break a home run record. And as, as the story goes, and, and whether there's truth to it or not, I don't, obviously I don't know. But uh, Sadahara O just so happened to be um, one of the ones that was, I believe, managing the opposing, the opposing manager at the time. And you would hear these stories about how they wouldn't pitch to him and all this stuff. Well, I think there's two, I think there's two elements at play there. I think that, um, one, I think Sadahara O is extremely special when it comes to his, um, when it comes to his, uh, the, the legend that he is, uh, not only in Japan, but he's in, you know, throughout, throughout the world and how he's recognized in baseball. Um, and so that was the first time that I think the Japanese culture was wrestling with maybe the idea that a foreigner would break a record that was so revered. Um, and I do think the home runs matter more than the hits in a lot of ways, obviously. So I think that was at play. I think that Ichiro, um, I did hear that having that Ichiro had gone to the U S and had broken the record, right. Uh, the U S record for hits in the season that somehow by him doing that kind of showed that it's okay um, for uh, a foreigner to break a record of sorts. And so, like, if, if it's good enough for the U.S. to allow him to break it, then why, why should we stand in the way of somebody else breaking it, right? Um, whether that's true or not, but that's what I heard. And then, um, and then how did it feel? Um, I had a lot of angst leading up to it. I honestly had gotten to the point where I recognized late in the season that if I didn't break it, it almost felt like I was a failure because it was sitting there right in front of me. And all that had to occur up to that point in order for me to have that chance, the odds of that ever occurring again were slim to none. So now I've got to take it through the finish line. Um, and I just remember being in that game that day and saying, like, man, we were in a pennant race. And, like, this is bigger than me. I can't make it about me. Too much attention. Too much is he going to do it? Is he not? I need to get this hit. I need to focus on my team. I was lucky enough to be up with the bases loaded. There's less than two outs. I really simplified the game and said, I just want to knock this guy in from third base. That's all I'm trying to do. And instead of trying to get the hit and knock the guy in from third, I ended up staying up the middle of the field and getting a base hit and got the, got the uh, record anyway. So um, it was like a kind of a sense of relief, to be honest with you. Um, and then once it processed, just a, a, there was obviously a respect uh, for what all I had been through, all of the people that had supported me to get there. My teammates were amazing. I was able to, that, that year, in order for me to do it, I let off. I had over 600 plate appearances and I hit 349, I believe it was. So to be healthy enough to be out there, to have the success to find the holes, and then to be on a good enough team that the, we, we hit well enough that I would get to the plate that many times and have that many opportunities and to have a manager that put me out there. And, uh, you know, this, the whole thing was like a culmination of, man, this is a lot of work from a lot of people. So it was really cool. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Last hand raised here, Chad. 
Heat up again. Actually, I was going to piggyback on Trevor's question here in the chat um, with another real quick one. But uh, which team or player? Um, it's a little bit different than Trevor's question, but which is there a team or a player that you're looking forward to watching this year, 2021? Like a certain style or just kind of an enthusiast for play? I know you mentioned the Padres. Even as a Cubs fan, I'm looking forward to watching, you know, Tatis and those guys down there uh, play each day. Um, but, uh, you know, which, 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 which team or player are you looking forward to watching this year? And um, I had another question about spin rates and everything, but I think that'll be get, get kind of long. So I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, but uh, I think I'll just go with, with Trevor's question then. Yeah. Um, so um, I, back in Japan, there's a player, uh, well, uh, Ch uh, Chikamoto, I believe it is, is a young player for the Tigers. Yeah. He's an outfielder. And, uh, you know, he's had some recent success. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch him this year. The one guy that I really want to watch, and I'm a little biased here, is a, kid, a young kid named Inoue. Um, he was drafted here recently, and I think there was something that came out that had, he had said something about he had he had mentioned myself and and what he was trying to. So I immediately had to pay attention. People were like, "Hey, this kid said something to you, said about you or what you had done in Japan or this and that." And so he's obviously a kid that's on the Tigers that I think is somebody that I want to follow and see how he does this year. I mean, I'm always pulling for the foreigners, uh, you know, always checking in on those guys and hoping they're doing well. You want to see everybody play well, but to Anyway, and then in the U.S., um, yeah, I mean, I think San Diego, I mean, obviously the Cubs, uh, I, I, I think I always will resonate. Cubs have always been home to me in a lot of ways, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, so I always, I will always root for them. Um, I was a Braves fan growing up. Um, they're interesting to watch. They got a lot of good young players. They're supposed to be a force in the NL East this year. And then out West, my brother works with San Diego and all that they have done here recently and kind of positioned themselves. Um, to have a chance to dethrone the Dodgers, which is not going to be an easy task, that's for sure. But right. to watch San Diego and LA, LA go at it this year, I think will be a lot of fun. Um, a one particular player, um, you know, my kids here at the house, they love Javi. They love Javi Baez, um, and they love Chris Bryant, right? So uh, I, I want to see, for Chris's sake, I want to see Chris um, just have a chance to go out and compete. I mean, last year was, you know, with COVID, it was hard for a lot of people. Um, and I, I just like to see those guys get out there and get a full season. And for him to, I mean, the guys, he, he, he accomplished, has accomplished so much in the game. He's accomplished more in the game in the first few years of his career than most anybody would ever imagine to accomplish throughout the, the, the course of 10 years, you know, 15 years. So he's a really special player um, that it would be really cool to see him kind of get back to uh, get back to uh, playing, I mean, whether it's health, his shoulder, you know, he's had some issues with the shoulder or different things that have kind of been hard for him. Um, it'll be cool to see. He seems like a really good guy the times I've been around him, so I'd love to see him play well. And you got to play with uh, Contreras a lot in Iowa in 2016. Of, of course. Of he's course. Uh, he's one that could really take that next step to be like maybe the top catcher in the in baseball in the next year or two as well. Yeah, it, it's true, and that's what kind of makes it unique. I feel like when you look at certain positions on the diamond, um, you know, you expect production from certain places. Um, and when you can start to get production from behind the plate like that, it really can change the, 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 the depth of a lineup. So um, he, he certainly, uh, given the fact that he is probably one of a handful of catchers in the game right now that can produce like he can offensively, um, it certainly gives, it certainly gives the, uh, the Cubs an edge almost every night they go out to play uh, behind the plate. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, John. All right, one quick question before my wrap-up question. What Japanese food or drink do you miss the most? Okay, um, yeah, the best food that I miss the most. Uh, I would just say yakiniku. And, and, I, and it's always like Yoshinoya, I love Yoshinoya, it's great, you know, it's all, but like, there's something about yakiniku, like the smell of the restaurant with the open flame and like, the, the, the beef being as amazing as it is with the sauce and the whole deal, like the whole nine yards is amazing. And it's really hard to replicate that. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just, it's hard to find yeah. um, here in the U.S. And then uh, what drink do I miss the most? Ah, maybe oolong cha. I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah, like, just a, yeah, or just a traditional hot green tea. You know, yeah. I like the hot green tea. So It's anyway. way better. It's better there. And it's, and they give it to you all the time. That's yeah, right. Good answer. 
Um, yeah. So <clears throat> final question. So what is next for you? You've had such a variety of experiences in, in the game around the world. You've got a family. What are you looking to do? What are your aspirations in the short and long term? So I've been trying to figure this is really hard. So for your whole life, right, you've been kind of told where to be, when to be there, the whole nine yards. It's all been defined for you. And now you have this space and I'm getting older, right? We're getting into this. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, like how do I like define that space? So I'm working on it. I don't want to bore you with it, but I'm working on it. I feel like I'm getting somewhere, but I do love the game. I do love people. Um, and the transition off the field the last three years to be able to evaluate and listen to the conversations built around analytics and R&D has been really healthy for me, I think. Um, what, if more than anything, it certainly broadens my background and, my, and it can give me a different perspective. Um, right now, as we talk, I'm helping out with Grace Christian Academy, as you saw on LinkedIn, and getting a chance to kind of pour into some high school athletes um, for the time being. And there's some conversations around some other stuff that potentially could happen but none of which we know, right? So I'm just trying to take it a day at a time. Um, I do love the game. I do think I, I envision myself staying involved in the game on some level and then uh, figuring out how can I make that work for both myself and my family, right? So for right now, staying local, helping the high school and doing that whole, and I came, I still have my stuff on. I came straight from practice today nice. to, to be here. So anyway. Nice. Well, I'm glad you're sticking around the game. Um, and I'm also really glad you joined us tonight. This is awesome. Really appreciate your uh, enthusiasm and and uh, your candid answers and you know really earnestly uh, um, answering them and, and treating our guests well. So this is a real treat for us and and I really appreciate having you on. Thanks so much, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I love You're it. You're welcome. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, well, you enjoy the uh, rest of the year. Hopefully, uh, you're able to get to the ballpark um, in in different ways uh, this year, and and maybe we'll see you there. Awesome. I'll call somebody shot. Maracondo, ne? Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Japan Ball's Chatter Up. For more content like this and other videos related to international baseball, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to learn more about our international baseball tours and everything else Japan Ball has to offer, check out japanball.com and sign up for our newsletter there. Thank you, and I'll see you at the ballpark.